All right, so Kev, you will also send us another oh, link great. when we Not finish uh, the shear so that we can join on another uh, quick. So that's not a problem. Um, uh, that's fine. And then Arthur, just for the sake of the video, uh, click on your image so that it records the first image that it sees uh, when I do the editing. So you include it. Yes. And Arthur is so careful with virus control. He even wears a mask for Zoom. All right, Rav, Kevin Mathel, kindly uh, teach us. Famous president of America, he also wore a mask when he said, uh, overseas. Yeah, but that's, that's different. That's because he, he got a lot of criticism, uh, Trump, unfortunately, because he didn't wear it around. Right. Biden. Yeah, but he, Biden's moggy. He doesn't know if he's got Zoom or not. He's so moggy. He doesn't, doesn't know. Know. he doesn't know where he doesn't even know where Afghanistan is. He like probably that. wears an adult diaper as well that they put on him. All right, let's get, start, let's get started. Gavin, yeah. you're starting. Hello, hi. Teach hi. us. Okay. Yes. I don't see, Sorry, I don't guys, see your visual. Kev? Now, I can see you. Yes, now we yeah. can see you. No, I lost you. Okay. Now, now we see you. Okay. Okay, okay, so let's start, continue this for the for, for the whole the holy of Israel. I can't hear you too well. Now Can we you can. put your mark in? And now, yes, is that, is that better? Yeah. Yes, okay, so uh, um, uh continuing now uh, the theme of Muksa, uh, Muksa at the onset of Shabbos. Okay, when an article has become when an article has become Muksa at the onset of Shabbos. It remains mukta throughout Shabbos, even if the original cause for being mukta no longer applies. For example, candlesticks containing wedding candles at the onset of Shabbos remain mukta for the remainder of that Shabbos, even after the candles have burnt out, have burnt out. When mukta when mukta may be moved, okay. When mukta may move, uh, mukta may be moved in an unusual way. For example, with one's foot. One may move muksa in a normal manner in the following circumstances. A, for human dignity, such as removing soiled diapers. B, when injury might occur, for example, to remove broken glass. C, when there's a risk of loss through theft or fire, for example, upon discovering money in one's pocket, one need not shake it out until reaching one's room, provided the malacha of carrying doesn't occur. For a sick person, for example, giving a pen to a Gentile doctor to write a prescription. And E, to alleviate an animal's pain. Okay, let's just go back to the, the other point here, where it says, uh, when, when there is a risk of loss to theft or fire, for example, okay, you've got money in your pocket, substantial amount, you don't really shake it out. It's probably in an air, it says, until reaching one's room. Providing the malacha of carrying doesn't occur. So it's probably within an Eruv and within a certain distance. Okay, and uh, the last one of this actual section of Muksa is indirect movement. And there's only one point here. And then there's a source. Okay, one may move a Muksa item by moving a permitted item against it. For example, sweeping up nutshells or removing cobwebs with a broom. This leniency applies only to a permitted requirement of the day. For example, tidying up. Okay, so uh, that's obviously uh, many items you clean and sweeping a floor. You can't exactly separate them because then you go for it. it could fall into the category of boira, which is separation. And so that's uh, that I think is probably self explanatory. And the source is, comes from the Chaye Adam, who says the more something is excluded from our minds, the more it is muksa. If a muksa item determined by a lack of purpose had been allocated a function before Shabbos, it would not be muksa. Malachic utensils are sometimes not muksa since they are commonly used during the week. But there are other types of muksa which on weekdays are more restricted in use or were not yet in existence. No such leniencies therefore apply to them. So that's, uh, that's muksa. That looks the finished that uh, chapter. We just uh, put the book away. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Kevin, that was interesting, but he, I didn't know that. Yeah. 
that's uh... it was interesting what I didn't know I don't know most things I find it all very interesting <laughs> okay so uh, tell me when you're ready to get started I'm just story, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not seeing well from the uh, from the injection, uh, Damon. I'm not well. I, I'm trying my best. But I'm just yeah, thinking, so, uh, I, I know that. Enough. I just take me for a, a good couple of days. Uh, today is one of the worst days. I'm actually so dizzy, but I'm going to give it my best shot. All right. Sham Arthur also wasn't well from it. Eh? He uh, really wasn't. He had the a booster shot or something for the in Israel, and it's, he said he felt lousy. Oh, really? Eh? Yeah, really lousy. And I don't know where Kevin's gone. It's 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 his link. Yeah, he's he's we have to wait for him now. But is that a new link? Period. Or I don't know what he's done. Not, I'm not sure. Because you want your forty minutes, don't you? At least. I don't know where he is. Okay, connection is a bit erratic today. So Mark, and you guys, are you all? Can you hear each other? We can hear you, but not well. But as long as you can hear us, because you're not talking yes. again. Yeah, you can uh, Damon, uh, you have, uh, You've got a terrible you signal. Hear, you you may have said something. I may not have uh, uh, Where's Arthur? I think your bandwidth terrible? is an issue. Kevin, do you want to reset your... your what are you on, your phone or your laptop? No, I can't use my computer. My, com my laptop needs a, a charger. But that's the why I'm using the phone. It's, it's, uh, no, listen, you seem to have come right. How long would it take you to set up the laptop? No, no, I haven't. I need to charge it. I don't have a charger. I haven't got... It's a different story. Uh, I, I need to use the phone. To, I can only use the phone tonight. There's no other option. There's no alternative. Okay, that's fine. But let's get... Kevin, let's get started. Uh, we can hear Kevin okay for now. Can you hear fine, us? Fine. Important. Can you can you hear us, Kev? Can you hear Gavin? Yeah, because Gavin's got good questions. Can you hear Gavin? No, I don't have today. Kevin, can you hear me? Can't yeah, you? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear? Kelly. Yes. All right, let's uh, let's get started, guys. All right, we're on fifty B three, and the Gemara is challenging Rav. Uh, so just a very big summary is that uh, um, we learned with regards to Rav, as you remember, that Rav holds that uh, if it's an ownerless pit, he holds like Rabbi Akiva, there's no liability. Whereas, uh, whereas Shmuel holds like Rav Yishmael and the rabbis, who says that it's not a matter of li it's not a matter of ownership, it's a matter of liability. In other words, you have to take ownership of the hazard you created. doesn't mean you have to own the property. So that's the divergent opinion. So therefore, Rav comes to say that if you, if you have an animal that dies in the impact of the fall, uh, Rav says you're not liable unless you own the pit, and if it's in public domain, you don't. But you can be liable for the uh, damage that you caused by bringing up all the toxic fumes and the soil, etc., where the animal breathes it in or it's exposed to its open wound and it dies as a contributing factor. And we learned that even if it's a contributing factor, since it contributed to the death, like we learned that case in Sanhedrin with Rav, Rabbi, uh, Rav Shimon, that said if you had people with a baseball bat and they're like nine people, and uh, basically is the final one created that... Um, the person would have died, but he hastened the death. It's as if he killed the person, whereas the rabbi said, no, he was a contributing factor. And since they all contributed, they exempt. It's a similar sort of discussion. So in other words, well, how does it relate here? Rav is saying, well, if the foul odor contributed to the death, you have to pay because a contributing factor is, is what's causative in any event. Okay? Even if it's one of the factors, Shmuel is saying to you, uh, same as Rav Yishmael, that whether you own the pit or not in a, a case in point is the public domain, you created a hazard. Therefore, if an animal died in the impact, you're liable. But he also says, same as Rav, 
you're liable for the foul air because you also kicked up the dust and everything else which the animal inhaled and created pulmonary damage to the lungs or infection of the organs when the organs were exposed upon impact. So again, Rav holds for foul air, uh, no impact. Shmua holds for foul air and impact. Gav, you get that. Very oh, yeah, that. Sorry, guys, I thought a summary is in order. It's been two days. Always, always busy after in a while. All right. So now the Gemara is challenging Rav. Uh, well, why does it challenge Rav? Because beforehand it said, as far as Rav was concerned, you're not liable if you create an excavation, let's just say a scaffold where the animal crawls on and falls and dies on impact because the animal never sucked up any foul air because you never created a cavity in the earth. So there you're not, where Shmuel said you're liable because uh, you created a hazard at which the impact killed. So even if a foul air wasn't a contributing factor. So now there's another challenge to Rav. And the challenge is as follows. It's on page 50b3. We learned in a Mishnah. If so, why is it specifically a pit mentioned in the Torah? It's to teach the following. Just as a standard pit has sufficient depth to cause death. What is that depth, guys, that causes death? Then, then, then whatever it's called. Ten Correct. Ten tefachim. The, the measurement is important. Yeah, tefachim is important, Gav, because it's like saying the difference between uh, meters and centimeters. It's a universe apart. So exactly as yeah, Gav said, yeah. ten tefachim deep is a pit sufficient to cause death. And it says, well, why is the classic case of pit mentioned in the Torah? When we're looking at a boar, I think you remember my explanation. You're creating a Let's just say a well where there's water. So it's a cylinder shape. Okay, it's a cylinder shape. Okay, it's a long cylinder. Oh. Kev, are you with me? You're frozen. Sorry, guys, just give me a sec. His bandwidth is terrible. I don't know what's happening there. He just arrived. When did he arrive? Yeah, yeah. Kev, can you see me now? Hello? Kevin, can you reset your modem? Your router, sorry. It's on his phone. No, he can't no, find the extension that connects to his laptop. So no, but I think his phone must go to his router. He must have a router there. I don't know if he's... Straight his, yeah, it might be straight to the phone because the bandwidth is cheap enough. In, in, in uh, Kev? I feel like this yeah. is the seance. Can you hear me, Bert? Yes, yes. Loud and clear. Okay, you faded there for a second. So I, I can hear you. What, you I've heard. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, is uh, all right, Now that you can hear me, there's a question posed to Ralph. Is, uh, listen, there's a classical case in the Torah of a pit. Now, what is the classical case of a boar? It's basically long and cylindrical, okay? And why is it is that it's for water. So why do we say you don't want a big uh, hole? Why don't you want a big hole? Because it, it, it evaporates. Exactly. Well done. You do pretty good. If that's you on an off day, I'd hate to see you on a devastatingly accurate day. So that's very impressive. <laughs> so I haven't had it before the last 15 years. So evaporation is exactly it. The bigger your width, the more it's likely to evaporate. So again, it's like a well. And it has to be wide enough so that multiple people can put in buckets at the same time. Otherwise, you'll be there all day. So firstly, you see there's a canopy on top of a well. Why? To stop evaporation, to keep it cool. There's always a canopy. And then there's a bar in the middle where there's a rope. And then there's buckets that you draw it. Okay, you draw it backwards and forwards, okay? So that, if it's not wide, it has to be deep. Why? Otherwise, you can't contain volume. It's about volumetric cubic centimeters. So it means that you need it to be long. That's how you get the ten tefachim deep. So then if that creates death, and that's mentioned in the Torah, how do we know you're liable for other sort of um, excavations, let's call it? And we know that from the Mishnah. Because the Mishnah mentions other excavations, it mentions a vault. 
which is square and it's got a covering uh, and it's got an entrance to go through because you keep your valuables there and you don't want people to see. That's why it's got a covering. So it looks like the rest of the ground. You hide out there, you hide things out there. Then you've got a, uh, a ditch. A ditch is used for, um, as we said, those mafia movies. They say, I'm going to leave you in a ditch. What's a ditch? It's a long, it's a, it's a long thin drop where you can put a coffin. So that's a ditch. And then you've got a wedge-shaped thing, and a wedge is like this. It's the opposite of a pyramid. So it's got a broad base, and it narrows as you're going down. That's a wedge. Uh, and uh, those are your different sort of things. So the Mishnah comes to clarify that it's including other sorts of excavations uh, or elevations. Does that make sense? So all is well according to Shmuel. Because the expression, the expression in the Mishnah says, uh, you liable, so too for any obstacle, etc. Remember the Mishnah in the beginning when we shared that? Uh, yeah. Gav, sorry, but you're coming up and you're sitting down. Are you are you able to? No, no. Are you no, with? I put a top on. No, I've got Willie, yeah, so all the windows are open, so it's cold. So I put it top Shame, on. man. All right. That's no, right. Uh, Not for you. Uh, all right, I just I just want to cover a little bit of progress. Um, um, no, on, I'm hearing you. All right, that, that's fine. So what we're saying is as follows. The first thing that it mentions in the Mishnah is the fact that it's saying, hang on, there are different sort of coverage of excavations. It says you liable if these excavations do damage. Uh, talks about a bore, and then it says, and so too, and it brings other items. So we can't find according to Shmuel. Why we find? Because Shmuel says you pay on impact. So it doesn't matter what sort of excavation. If an if animal splits itself and it's dead, you're covered. And you're covered for the foul air, according to Shmuel, so you're covered. But what we want to know is, uh, does does it cover for other excavations if you hold um how do you hold so this is it so it says we learned in a mishnah so why specifically a pit mentioned in the torah it's to teach the following just as a standard pit has sufficient depth to cause death being ten to fucking deep so too for any obstacle that has sufficient depth to cause death which is ten to fucking one is liable all is well according to shmuel for the expression, so too, includes any obstacle. Does that mean, uh, it says for the expression, so too, for any obstacle, etc. And what's it coming to be understood is it's coming to include an elevation. Do you remember before it said, well, what happens if you create an elevation or scaffold? And we said, well, Shmuel, you covered. And Rav said, no, because you're not digging up the earth, so there's no foul air. So we're saying, what if you create an elevation and it's not an excavation? An excavation is what you dig. An elevation means there's still a drop at which it could be lethal. How does Rav explain it? And, and then it's, the question to Rav is, well, then why would the Mishnah, if Rav is correct, mention all these other obstacles if you're not covered for it? That's the question to Rav, including an excavation. So the answer that Rav would give you is he says, look, it comes to include squared off pits and wedge like pits, meaning he also includes these other things apart from the biblical classical pit. Why does it use the example of squared off pits and wedge like pits? Because it could have easily have used the term ditches and vaults. It mentions those two things because they're diametrically opposed and characteristic to a pit. Because, Kevin, a pit is like long and thin and cylindrical. We're saying to we saying to Rav, how does he explain um, why these other things are mentioned in the Mishnah, including it's saying you're responsible for all sorts of uh, obstacles, including excavations and elevations. Why would you need the Mishnah to mention the word um, that uh, so too for any obstacle, etc. Because uh, Shmuel would say you could include an elevation or anything. So uh, obviously, Rav uh, comes to answer. It comes to include squared off pits and wedge like pits. 
meaning even things that don't resemble a normal pit, because a normal pit is long and cylindrical, and a wedge-like pit is the opposite. At the bottom, it's narrow, and at the top, it's very wide. And a squared pit doesn't resemble a thin, long pit like a, uh, a standard bore in the Torah. So it's coming to include all those other sort of damages. Fine. So the Gemara say, objects to this explanation, and it said, well, squared off pits and wedge like pits are mentioned explicitly in the Tana earlier in the Mishnah, so why do we allude to them here? So what it's saying is it's an answer that's just repeating what's in the Mishnah. I mean, why mention it twice? So the Gemara responds, the Tana first teaches that one is liable even for squared of pits or wedge like pits, and then he explains where the law is derived. So what Rashi's commentary is on that is he explains from where we derive these excavations there must be ten tefachim deep in order for the digger to be liable if the animal falls in and dies. So as far as Rav and Shmuel are concerned, anything that's ten tefach deep is liability for death. So the first question that should pop in your mind is, if Rav doesn't include impact of fall, what difference does it make if it's ten tefach or not? Surely that's a question that pops in your mind. So we're going to see now what difference it makes if it's that length. Because it only makes a difference if you're talking about height if one dies on impact, one's animal dies on impact. But if uh, impact isn't taken into the equation and only fell air, what difference does it make how deep a pit is? Does that make sense, guys? That's basically the question on rough in a nutshell. So... The Gemara answers, it's necessary for the Tana to mention every one of them because if he had taught the law only for regarding a pit, I might have said that it's only a pit of ten tafachim that has foul air because a pit is small and round so that the air stagnates inside it. But as for a ditch which is long and more spacious, I would say that even with the depth of ten tafachim, it does not have foul air that can cause death. So what's the principle that we're saying here, guys, is that Rav says that the foul air kills. So, so the thing of it is, why do you need ten tafachim? Because if you're dealing with a pit, that's like this. Think of a pit like this. Kev, look at the screen. If you look at this highlighter, it's very long and thin. So you say if you dig that sort of hole, that there'd be a lot of toxicity with the soil, like a mine, asbestos mine. But if something was long, it would escape. The foul air would escape. Because remember, I dig a hole this month. I'm liable if somebody falls in next month. It's not like I've dug it this morning and this afternoon somebody falls in. So it feels there's enough time maybe for the foul air to, to escape. So Rav is coming to say, it doesn't matter what the shape of the pit is. Ten tafachim is not enough to allow to escape, even if it's got a wide hole and it's spacious. Does that make sense? Because your logic would have said that maybe you're not obligated. Also, I might have said, as the Gemara says, if it's a ditch of ten tafachim that is foul air, because the thin it is narrow, but as for a vault which is squared off and is shaped thus allows for circulation of the air, I would say that even with a depth of ten tafachim, it does not have foul air that can cause death. So it's saying, hang on a second. It's even less so when you take a square pit because a ditch at least is narrow. And maybe you could think that, uh, Gav, just look at my screen. Everybody's doing other things. No, I'm just taking a meditation, so I went to right now. I'm dying. Sorry. Okay, so, uh, Gav, if you have a look at my, my screen, if you've got a ditch that's long and narrow, you could think maybe that the air couldn't escape. But when you've got a, a wide square ditch, you would think in that case the foul air wouldn't carry. So it's saying no matter what example, as long as you've got that depth, it's not you can be assured that the foul air wouldn't escape to the extent that it could cause death. And that anything that's tenta for him, it doesn't have sufficient... Uh, it's too deep to be able to escape, no matter what the shape of the pit is. And the Tana taught the law regarding a vault. I might have said that if it's a vault of ten tafachim that is foul air, 
because the vault is covered with a roof so that the air can't escape. But maybe a squared off pit, which are shaped like vaults but have no covering, I would say that even with a depth of 10 tafakhim, they do not have foul air that is trapped in that can cause death. And if the Tana had taught the law regarding squared off pits, I might have said it's squared off pits of 10 tafakhim that have foul air because they're not wider on top than on the bottom. But for wedge like pits that are wild on the top than the bottom, the air could even more readily escape. And then I would have said that even a depth with 10 tafakhim, they do not have foul air to create uh, death. So the Tana therefore informs us in the Mishnah that all of these excavations, if 10 tafakhim deep, have sufficiently foul air to cause death of an animal that falls in. So Rav's covered. The only thing that Rav wouldn't cover for is a scaffold that you create off the ground. Why? Because you haven't dug up the earth in an excavation. That's an elevation, like a scaffold. It's not an excavation. Any excavation of ten tafakhim or more is capable of being lethal in terms of the um, particles, etc. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's fine. So the Gemara starts another challenge. We we learned in a Mishnah, if any of the excavations were less than 10 tafakhim deep and an ox or a donkey fell in it and died, the digger is exempt. But if the animal was merely injured by falling into the pit, the digger is liable. What is the reason that when the excavation is less than 10 tafakhim deep, if an ox or donkey fell in it and died, the digger is exempt? It is not because in that case, the excavation lacks the capacity to cause death through the impact of the fall, though it presumably has foul air. So what it's saying is the commentary by Rashi is the Gomorrah assumes that even a shallow excavation has foul air and lacks, uh, and lacks only the capacity to kill through impact. Does that make sense? So what it's saying is that how does that answer? Uh, how does that answer um, as far as that's concerned? Because um, basi basically, and since the Mishnah nevertheless exempts the digger when the animal dies, it contradicts Rab and Shmuel. For both of them said that a person is liable when his excavation causes death through its foul air. Okay. Uh, so what's what's it saying? What's the challenge what, uh, to both of them? It's saying, look, Rav and Shmuel agree on one thing. Foul is a contributor to death. Whereas Shmuel says only uh, impact is also a factor, Rav said it's not. So what we're learning here is that if it's 10 tafakh deep, only the impact uh, could pr probably create kill, killing. Uh, not the foul air. So how do that, if it's not the foul air, it disagrees with both Rav and Shmuel, technically. You say it's a contributing factor to the death. Does that make sense? Yes, it agrees with Shmuel on one level, but on one level it does criticize, it does contradict Shmuel, as well as Rav, because they both see foul air as a factor. So that challenge is rejected. Why? No. It's, uh, the Gemara says, the reason for the Mishnah ruling is because an excavation of less than 10 tafakhim lacks foul air. What do we mean? If it lacks sufficient depth to cause death through the impact of the fall, the, so the Mishnah is exempting the digger for the animal's death presents no difficulty according to Rav and Shmuel. Because it's saying that, listen, it's not that it's not the depth that's going to kill in terms of the impact. It's got to be the foul air. So they're saying, listen, any excavation less than 10 tafakhim lacks the foul air. So understanding this as meaning that the excavation is no foul air at all, the Gemara objects. If so, how will you explain the Mishnah's latter clause? For if the animal is merely injured by falling into the pit, the digger is liable where there's no foul in the excavation. So what's it asking, guys? It's a question. 
Do you know, or do you want me to repeat it? What it's saying is, if the excavation has no foul air at all, if it's less than 10 tefachim, and the animal is injured in it, why would you have to pay for injury? Because both Rav and Shmuel say that if it's less than 10 tefachim, you have to pay for injury. But if we take Rav as an example, who holds that we don't pay an impact, whether it's injury or death, because you don't own the pit in the public domain. Okay? And, and, and that um, uh, you don't pay for that. And we're saying there's only foul air if it's more than tefachim, 10 tefachim. The question the Gemara is asking is if it's less than 10, ten tefachim, how does Rav hold that you would have to pay for injury? Even Shmuel, but the question on Rav is more strong because he doesn't hold that uh, impact provides a contributory factor. So he's going to obviously say the, the, the foul air again. Okay, so again, guys, I want you to repeat to me the question. So I know you understand it. Um, Kev, what's the question? question? Um, is it Rav or Shmuel says that impact is not a factor in the death of a uh, if an animal falls in. Correct, Rav so, does. But what's the Gamora's question in terms of injury? Do you want me to repeat it? I can. It's not a problem. You've had a long flight. I can tell you what the question is. came at four o'clock this morning. Gavin, no, I know you know. Uh, I know you know. But can I... Gavin t- knows. Gavin could take the share. We know that. He's oh, taking it. No, no, no. Now you can. You've been too modest there. Damon. So, <laughs> so Gab, I just want to I just want to try it another time if you don't mind. I know you're not. Uh, is that by the way, Arthur, you are you there? Are you alive? I mean, are we ever gonna see you? He's not Damon, he, even though he looks he's not a no name brand, even though you can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, when I don't see a person, I don't know if they're actually in the shear or they're asleep or I don't know. Yeah, no, it's 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 disconcerting. No. Arthur, are you there? He has a name. <laughs> just say the name, maybe you'll answer then. <laughs> All right, Paul. Is his name the name, Gavin? All right. All right, so Kevin, the question is as follows. Um, is that, look, Rav says you have to pay for injury of less than 10 tefachim. You have to pay for death more than 10 tefachim, same as Shmuel. But since we know that more than 10 tefachim, the excavation is deep enough to have foul air. Okay, we have foul air. We understand why Rav would say that you have to pay for the death of more than 10 tefachim. But Rav holds that for less than 10 tefachim, if an ox or a um, donkey was injured in it, you'd have to pay for the injury. But if there's no foul air at less than 10 tefachim, and Rav does not hold by impact being a factor in damage because you don't own the pit in the public domain, how does he hold you liable for damages? That's the question. Do you understand? So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it now. Is that um, if uh, the Kamara answers, they say in an excavation of less than ten tafahim, there's not sufficient foul air to cause death, but there is sufficient foul air to cause injury. Meaning, uh, yeah. So there's some staleness in the air of a shallow pit. So that an animal can become ill and debilitated by breathing it in, but he can't die from it. That's Rashi's explanation. But anything more than ten tefachim is sufficient foul air to be able to be lethal if breathed in through the animal because it leaves deposits on the pulmonary organs. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Okay. Um, so um so we're just gonna we're just gonna read on so that makes sense 
So it's pro it's pro rata. You still have to pay for the injury of the foe heir. A related incident is cited. There was a certain ox that fell into an irrigation ditch that was ten six uh, six tefachim deep. Okay. Um, so this was the depth. It was also the width, and that's a standard irrigation depth, uh, uh, guys. It's a square. It's a square cube basically for irrigation, and it's basically six, it's six tefachim, which equals one amma. So an irrigation ditch is often called amot hamayim, the water amma. It's according to Rashi. So picture this, guys: six tefachim deep and wide, and a certain ox fell in uh, that was six tefachim deep. Its master slaughtered it immediately. And Rav Nachman declared a trefer on account of the injury it was presumed to have suffered in the fall. Okay, so what's a trefer, guys? What's a what's animal a that hasn't been shafted properly. Uh, that's that's true, but there's a or for organs spending. that are not that are not perfect, that are not that are, that are not suitable for slaughter. slaughter. Animal that's not. Uh, you can't give up for, 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 for a korban. Okay, that's correct. That's correct. But there's two definitions of trefa. The reason it becomes trefa, we see trefa as kosher and trefa, the opposite of kosher. Yeah. Trefa means ineligible for use. The real term trefa means that it's basically like dead man walking or dead animal walking. What do you mean? Is that... The, <laughs> In Shmuel chapter 22, verse 30, uh, meat of a trefer can't be eaten, Kevin, even if it was properly slaughtered. So that seems weird because it's got a defect, as Kevin said. Now, there are 18 specific physical defects, Kevin, and it's in Chulin in the 42nd Duff. And it's presumably fatal, those defects, okay? So when we talk about a human being being a trefer, we talk about a human being that might be terminal cancer, for example. So one of the arguments we learned in Sanhedrin is if a person commits a murder when they almost a terminally ill person, do you give them the death penalty because it's like a dead person committing the crime? Or you can ask the question in Sanhedrin the other way around, and they did. If you kill somebody that's maybe got a, a, a day left and you put them on heavy morphine so they don't suffer, have you actually ended their life prematurely and are you responsible for killing them or, or not? Again, the same discussion with the rabbis and Rabbi Shimon. Is it hastening death uh, the result of taking an entire life or are you only taking a little portion that's left? In other words, it's terminal. The case is terminal. Who do you hold by? So why do we say that the animal is a trafer here? Well, one very reason. So picture this. The animal falls in, and it's six tefachim deep. And the master wanted to get some benefit from it, so he slaughtered it immediately. Now, Rav Nachman uh, called a trefer. On account of the injury, it was presumed to have suffered in the fall. But you only declared a trefer um, if... Um, trefer is known in this case as... Uh, one of the fatal injuries is called shattering of the limbs. Okay? In other words, it's internal bleeding. There's no visible injury, but it's unable to stand up. So what they do, guys, if they let the animal survive for 24 hours, and then the concern is removed, and then you can slaughter and eat it. So it's the same thing. If somebody... If somebody... Uh, Punches somebody else. I think there, there it's not 24 hours. I think that it's three days, Gavin. We learned it. in Sanhedrin. I don't think it was 24 hours. I think it could have been three days. I'm not sure offhand. But if the person walks around their bed three days later and dies, you're not responsible for having killed them. Because it's not as a direct result of the impact within a certain given period. So if the animal survives 24 hours, it hasn't died as a direct timeline from its physical injury. At mark, then it's basically considered indirect damage. So what happens, Rav Nachman said, 
that he should have waited 24 hours to see that this animal recovered. You can't just slaughter an animal when it could be, uh, it could have a fatal injury uh, in order to eat it because it's trafa. It could be one of those 18 things in Chul in 42a that render it unable to shech because it could be on the terminal list from internal bleeding. So Rav Nachman said he can't get use out of the animal. So the question of Rav's is basically this. If it's six to fachim deep, we know you're not liable for killing an animal, only 10. So what gives you? That's the big question. You understand? Kev? Yeah. <clears throat> what am I saying here? Um, okay, let me try put it in other words. Uh, yeah. If it's okay, it, it may be. I think I may got a have it, but I don't okay. know. My mind, I'm a bit hot. Okay, no problem. I'm, I'm awake, but I'm hot. So if the, the animal falls into a pit and it happens to be a trafe and, and the foul air kills it, it's going. It was going to. It, it was on its last legs anyway. So. Maybe there is no case for 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 damages or li or liability to the owner. I think is that what you said? No, I'll I'll phrase it again. Whether you hold by Rav that a pit that's more than tougher, Rav and Shmuel both say that foul air will kill an animal, but Shmuel says even impact will. So both of the, so anything that's ten tafachim or more is lethal as a pit. Whatever reason you assign to it, impact or foul air. Anything less is injurious. So we learned here of a case where an ox fell in a ditch. It's uh, whatever sort of ditch. It was an irrigation ditch. It's, it's an Amos ditch, which is six tefachim. Now that's not a lethal ditch, but Rav Nachman said that the owner that slaughtered the animal can't use the animal because it's trafer. And the trafer means that it's, it's terminal. It's terminal, and at the very least, it has to be a minimum of 10 tefachim, okay? In order, and for example, say it's 10 tefachim, it's lethal, but the animal doesn't die. It doesn't die. It fell in an indirect way or whatever, and then you wait 24 hours to see if it recovers, and if it recovers, you can then shecht it, which you should do, because by the way, it could die three days later. You, don't, you, you sit there with a stopwatch. After 24 hours, you kill it the minute that time's over, just to make sure that the animal doesn't die of injuries. Then you really can't use it. Does that make sense? So what we're saying here is as follows, is that at the end of the day, he did wrong, because now he can't use the animal at all. It's trafa. But the question is, why would Rav Nachman say it's trafa? Because nothing is at risk of killing in terms of liability if it's less than 10 uh, tefachim. And this was six. So if it was six, how could it be rendered a suspected trafa where you can't slaughter it within 24 hours until it's gone through observational watch? That's the question. All right, guys, I'm going to leave it on this note. Arthur's gone AWOL. Okay. We've checked with him a few times. He's not on the video. Uh, you've had a, a, a massive flight. Gavin's not feeling well. And I kind of and figured like... Oh, we asked is. you questions before in the shirt. <laughs> Did you? We were speaking to you before the in the shirt. Can you maybe just go over it for Arthur and for me? Just to say it once more what you last said. Um, just go over it once more. But Arthur, were you, you wanted Damon to go over it? Were, were you even, but were you listening, Arthur, before? We tried to get hold of you. Yeah, I was listening, but I don't have my headphones, so it's kind of a, a problem. As, no, that's fine. As long as you heard me, then that's fine. So, well, Kevin, I, so all, I, all, all Rav Nachman is saying is as follows, Kevin. He's just saying that in this case where he said that the owner's animal that rendered it, that slaughtered it, can't use it because it's trafa. The question the Gemara asks is how could it be a trafa at only six tefachim? Because anything that's ten tefachim is trafa. And if it doesn't die on impact, you can't slaughter it unless you wait 24 hours to see if it's going to die. Because it's rendered, it's rendered out of bounds until you see it survives 24 hours. You can't, so, you can't share the terminal animal. So the question is, if it's only six tefachim, how does Rav Nachman render it 
Trifa, because we learned that Patentafachim is lethal, not six. Does that make sense? That's the problem, Gar. Not, not six if it if it uh, sorry. Not six <coughs> if it if it if it if it dies at the six if it is there's no is that is that what what's the whole thing with six tvachy? Okay, so all I'm saying is anything under ten is not deemed lethal, you should be able to okay. slaughter it without waiting twenty four hours. If it's ten or more and it's lethal and the animal doesn't die, you have to have a a waiting period to see if it recovers for 24 hours before you, uh, if uh, before you're allowed to slaughter it, because then it's not deemed a trafer. You can't slaughter and use a trafer.